Good afternoon. I'm Mark Elliott. I'm the uh, chair of the uh, law faculty in Cambridge. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event, which is jointly hosted by the uh, law faculties at um, Oxford and uh, Cambridge. So the, the purpose of the event uh, today is to enable discussion um, of issues raised by the terms of reference for the Independent Human Rights Act review. Um, we'll begin the afternoon uh, with an overview of the review panel's uh, work. Um, and after that, we'll divide our time between uh, three sessions. So first, we'll have some initial perspectives on the Human Rights Act. Second, we'll move on to looking at the relationship between domestic courts and the European Court of Human Rights. And then thirdly, we'll look at the domestic impact of the HRA in terms of the relationship between the judiciary, the executive and the uh, legislature. Um, and as those of you who are familiar with the terms of reference will know, the second and third sessions uh, track uh, the major themes um, in the uh, terms of reference. Each of those three sessions will begin with some opening remarks uh, by colleagues uh, from uh, Oxford and Cambridge, and then they'll be followed by a period of uh, discussion. So we're joined this afternoon by members of the Independent Human Rights Act Review Panel um, and by uh, members of the uh, Oxford and Cambridge uh, law faculties. So from the panel, uh, we have uh, Sir Peter Gross, who is the, the chair of the panel, um, along with uh, Maria Carhill, Simon Davis and Sir Stephen Laws. From Oxford, uh, we're joined by uh, Kate O'Regan, uh, who will be chairing this afternoon's uh, discussion sessions, um, and also um, Anne Davis, Richard Eakins, Timothy Endicott and Sa Sa Sandra Fredman. And from Cambridge, uh, we have Nick Friedman, Stevie Martin and Alison Young. Finally, just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, points. So we're recording this afternoon's um, event and the recording will be made available uh, in due course online. Uh, there was a chance to submit questions via a web form prior to uh, the event starting. Um, and those questions where possible will be fed in uh, to the discussion. If you didn't uh, have a chance to submit a question ahead of time, but would like to do so, uh, you can do that, but please use the Q&A function in Zoom rather than the web form, which is now uh, closed. So I'll uh, get things started now by handing over to uh, the chair of the review panel, Sir Peter Gross. Good afternoon. A warm thank you to both Oxford and Cambridge universities and in particular, Professors Elliot and Eakins uh, for facilitating this roadshow, together with Daniel Bates, who has borne the brunt of some of the technical work, a roadshow to discuss the Independent Human Rights Act Review, IRA, because everything must have an acronym and that is ours. Thank you too to the IRA Secretariat for the organizational work done. Uh, it is not taken for granted. Uh, my only and very real regret is that we are not meeting in person, but I hope that such meetings will not be too long delayed. That said, a side benefit of working remotely is the ability to have a combined Oxford-Cambridge roadshow. Had we been meeting in person, I suspect neutrality would have driven us to Milton Keynes as the venue. IRA has three features of paramount importance. First, the review is independent. The I in IRA is there deliberately. Secondly, there is an independent and formidable panel who bring to bear a wealth of varied experience and viewpoints. Today, I am delighted to be accompanied by three panel colleagues, Professor Maria Carhill, Mr. Simon Davis, and Sir Stephen Laws. You will see them on the screen. Thirdly, the terms of reference are expressed in neutral terms. They do not beg the question or suggest preconceived answers. There are none. May I next underline the scope of IRA, outlining both what it is and what it is not doing. It is a fixed premise of IRA that the United Kingdom is committed to remaining a party 
to the European Convention on Human Rights, the Convention. Next, IRA is not looking at substantive convention rights. IRA is instead solely focused on the operation of the Domestic Human Rights Act, the HRA. With one exception, all the questions raised in the terms of reference are domestic only. The exception concerns the extraterritorial application of the HRA. IRA is UK wide. The panel is very much alive to devolution sensitivities, very much including the circumstances prevailing in Northern Ireland. From the outset, openness and transparency have been hallmarks of IRA. I made this clear in some 38 conversations with interested parties at the time of our launch. Our call for evidence was open-ended. We encouraged responses from individuals and organizations wherever they might be on the spectrum of opinion and received upwards of 150 responses. Say for exceptional reasons, we have made it clear that all responses would be uploaded on the IRA website. IRA and I personally are most grateful to everyone who has responded. In that regard, may I specifically <coughs> thank both universities represented today for, if I may say so, the richness of their contributions in response to the review and the call for evidence. We have or are to hold 15 round tables and seven online roadshows, the latter very generously facilitated by universities around the United Kingdom as today's is by Oxford and Cambridge. The IRA panel remains in listening mode. Our report will be published, uh, as will the government's response. In the meantime, through stimulating and regular online meetings, the panel is working its way through the issues raised in the terms of reference. It is doing so without preconceptions and subject, of course, to further thought, reflection and revision of any preliminary impressions once we have absorbed the evidence, roundtables, and roadshows. The panel is excellently supported by two independent legal advisors, one of whom, Dr. John Sarabji, is present today, together with a secretariat provided by the Ministry of Justice. As to timescale, IRA is due to report in the summer, ideally providing options rather than binary recommendations, for consideration by government. No one on the panel has any interest in drawing things out, but every one of us is committed to taking what time is needed to produce a review of the right quality. At this stage, of course, IRA does not have any conclusions, but may I say a very few words about the topics we are considering, just giving them a little flavor. IRA has two key themes. The first focuses on the relationship between the courts of the United Kingdom uh, and the European Court of Human Rights, or the Strasbourg Court, as I shall sometimes say. The second theme on the impact the HRA has had on the relationship between the three branches of state, the judiciary, executive, and legislature, or what the late and much missed Sir John Laws might have termed the impact on the constitutional balance. Our starting point, as made clear in the preamble to the terms of reference, is the immense contribution made by the United Kingdom to human rights law. There is nothing new in this, insofar as the common law has protected individual rights for centuries. We are carefully examining whether the common law's role in this area is receiving proper attention and emphasis. IRA has well in mind the objectives clearly articulated when the HRA was enacted. One was, quote, to bring rights home, to save United Kingdom citizens and residents the need to go to the court in Strasbourg to enforce their claims. This is an important consideration because to the extent that there is a gap between the protection of human rights available in UK courts and that available in Strasbourg, uh, 
it will incentivize more claims going to Strasbourg and thus run counter to the original objective of bringing rights home. Another objective was to facilitate a distinctive British contribution to human rights law, a matter which is the subject of intense reflection on our part. Meshing these objectives forms an important part of our consideration of Section 2 HRA, that our courts should take into account Strasbourg jurisprudence and also utilize the margin of appreciation, the discretion provided by Strasbourg to each state to fashion how it gives effect to convention rights. The final question under the first theme concerns strengthening and preserving the dialogue between UK courts and the Strasbourg court. In one sense, how can our courts most effectively influence the development of Strasbourg case law? In all this, IRA is looking at how to improve and strengthen the way in which the HRA operates. Turning to our second theme, the constitutional balance, the first topic goes to the approach to legislative interpretation provided for in Section 3 HRA. It requires courts to construe statutes where possible in conformity with convention rights. We are also looking at the relationship between Section 3 and Section 4, Section 4 containing the power to make declarations of incompatibility. What would be the effect of changing the approach under Section 3 or giving a greater role to Section 4? And where a declaration of incompatibility is made by the courts, is there a need to change the manner in which legislation is amended to make it compatible with convention rights? A valuable scrutiny role is undoubtedly played by the Joint Committee on Human Rights, the JCHR, and IRA is carefully studying the work of the JCHR, considering whether there is more it might be able to do to improve both the reality and perception of parliamentary scrutiny. Time does not permit more than the mere mention of the remaining questions under theme two. So IRA is called on to consider the manner in which the UK derogates from rights protected by the convention in emergency situations. Next, should courts have the same powers in respect of quashing secondary legislation in this sphere as they have elsewhere under general doctrines of administrative law, themselves doubtless to be considered in the future in the light of the IRAL report. That leaves, dare I say in quotation marks, only the question of the extraterritorial extra application of the HRA and the complexities and sensitivities in the sphere of devolution. Quite a lot to think about then. I could go on, uh, but more than enough from me. Thank you all very much. For my part, I am greatly looking forward to the discussion which follows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Peter, for that very clear overview of the issues that the panel is uh, now considering. We're going to turn straight to the first um, discussion that we're going to have this afternoon, and I'm not going to introduce the speakers because time is very short, but if you want to know about them, you'll find the information about them on the faculty websites, the relevant fac faculty websites. So our first speaker uh, on a, the topic of the, an overview of the Human Rights Act uh, will be Stevie Martin. Stevie. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in the Roadshow, which I think is a very important process of gauging wider uh, views regarding the Human Rights Act. Um, I've, I've only got five minutes, so I'll keep it very brief. Uh, I thought that the opportunity to offer some initial uh, perspectives would be nicely framed by revisiting, um, as Sir Ross has just done, the, the objectives that the Human Rights Act set out to achieve and to see how effective it has been uh, in the ensuing 20 years in achieving those objectives. And in particular, we see, uh, especially in the Rights Brought Home report, White Report, uh, three primary purposes for the Human Rights Act. And they are to address what was seen to be a lacuna in the common law and the discord between the right 
Stevie, you seem to have frozen. Can you hear us? I think what we'll do in the circumstances, Richard, is we'll turn to you for your co commentary and hopefully Steve will be able to get back with us shortly. Of course, um, and I hope we'll, we'll um, hear more from Steve in just a minute. Uh, well, let me say um, my thanks to, to everyone for the opportunity to participate in this, in this discussion. Uh, like many other colleagues, I made a submission to the review, which you can, you can find online, um, setting out, in my case, um, with a colleague, uh, some arguments for legislative reform. But what I want to do in, in my brief remarks today is, is really just frame discussion about how the HRA protects rights and to note the significance of the changing shape of the Act over time. The HRA is an important statute, of course, uh, but its enactment was not a revolution. Quite apart from the HRA, human rights have long been protected in the UK by way of ordinary statutes, common law, and the disciplines of the political constitution. Moral rights are given legal force in ordinary statutory provisions, as well as in common law propositions. Parliamentary sovereignty means, of course, that these legal rights are not secure against further legislative change. It means it's for Parliament on behalf of and in conversation with the people to settle or to reopen controversies about rights and to decide how best to give legal force uh, to moral rights. The HRA changes the constitution by adding a new way in which to attempt uh, to protect rights. The Act introduces convention rights as well as related Strasbourg jurisprudence into domestic law. It arms UK judges to elaborate and to enforce convention rights and uphold them to some extent at least against other statutes, whether by way of interpretation or declaration. And it aims to incentivize government and parliament to act consistently with convention rights. In thinking about the HRA, I think one should note its dynamic character. The act as enacted is not identical to the act as it has developed over time in our courts. Now, clearly the meaning and content of convention rights changes over time with the balance of judicial opinion in our courts and to some extent in line with Strasbourg jurisprudence. The skepticism about the merits of the HRA is sometimes met with the question, the question which of the rights in the ECHR would one want to live without? Uh, and Lord Bingham uh, was fond of asking that question. But what was agreed in 1950 is not what the HRA introduces into our law, save in a highly formal sense. Likewise, the HRA does not secure the rights understood or as understood in 1998. The content of convention rights is subject to change as judicial opinion changes. And one sees that dynamic quite vividly in relation to human rights litigation about immigration and asylum. As a recent paper by John Finnis and Simon Murray, the forward from, from Lord Hoffman, makes clear. Now, I think the HRA contemplates and permits the meaning of convention rights to shift over time. But other changes to the Act, I think, are harder to square with Parliament's intentions in 1998. So consider the temporal scope of the Act and the extent to which it applies to events before October 2000, or the spatial scope of the Act, which Sir Peter has touched on, the extent of the Act's extraterritorial application of any. Likewise, as I expect we'll discuss later, the meaning and application of sections two and three have scarcely been stable. Section four has become a freestanding ground of abstract review, rather than a power that uh, arises in other proceedings, uh, which might be limited by the section seven victim requirement, for example. And finally, there's of course, considerable variation across time, as well as across changing panels of judges in how willing courts are to defer to other institutions. In evaluating the Act, I think one needs to consider what was enacted, how it has developed over time, and how it may yet develop, unless and until there is legislative intervention. It can scarcely be objectionable in principle, uh, I say, for Parliament to legislate to correct the ways in which the courts have developed the HRA, or for Parliament to change the way in which particular rights have been interpreted, either by amending the HRA or by way of other legislation. I think the HRA's dynamic character complicates its capacity to secure rights. Litigation about convention rights may undermine and breach otherwise settled legislated rights. This is a constitutional problem, I think, even if the courts often act well. Consider legislation prohibiting assisted suicide, which has been uh, subject to repeated challenges in the courts. While the courts have thus far largely, and I think rightly, seen off the challenge, the HRA has armed political opponents of the Suicide Act to invite judicial support for their campaign. And that's a dynamic that politicizes adjudication, poses a risk to the rule of law, as I think the Purdy judgment showed, 
and threatens to distort subsequent parliamentary deliberation. In the context of assisted suicide, I say that the, I the HRA puts the right to life in some danger. So in thinking about the merits of the Act, one should keep in mind the dynamics it sets in motion and the risks that they may pose, not only to constitutional principle, but also to human rights. And that's what I had to say by way of initial perspectives. Thanks, Richard, and thanks very much for keeping to time. That's a, that's a, a great act to follow. Uh, Stevie, I'm pleased to see that you're back again. I'm sorry you've had a technical hitch. It's always very concerning. <laughs> and very not your fault, I'm sure. So we'll we'll return to you, and and please feel free to start again if you, that would make it easier for you. Thank you. No, I can I can just continue given what Professor Ekins has said. Um, it, in terms of the focus, then that I will look at, and I will keep it very brief given the technological difficulties that have eaten into the time. Um, focusing in, in terms of that lacuna in in rights protection, uh, one of the greatest issues that confronted the UK in the lead up to the enactment of the Human Rights Act was the 50 or so cases that it had been unsuccessfully uh, a respondent in before the European Court uh, during uh, the, the prelude to the Human Rights Act. And one of the primary reasons for that uh, lack of success in some respects was the lack of rights protection and the inability to enforce rights before domestic courts. And this is something which continues in terms of the common law uh, in, in some respects in terms of its scope of protection. And certainly there can be no doubt that the European Convention goes further. Uh, it has the margin of appreciation as well as the living instrument doctrines which underpin the ability of the European Court to interpret the European Convention. Um, but in terms of our common law, we've seen quite recently a number of key cases. <laughs> Shame, Stevie, you're obviously having a difficult afternoon with, oh, with technical. Oh, there you are. You're just breaking up a little bit, Stevie, so can you just go back a sec? Just she, was, to... she was just about to tell us about the key cases. Yeah, <laughs> right. So you are again. Sorry, I'm it extremely... might be easier if you want to turn your turn your video off because if we if if you think it's connection and it'll be better without it, do feel free to do that. I'm extremely sorry. Please forgive forgive these technological difficulties. Um, I was just going to speak very briefly about several recent cases, including uh, the seminal UK Supreme Court decision of El Ghazuli, some might say, um, which Lord Carr gallantly tried to expand the common law to prevent the sharing of information from the UK to the US where it may be used in proceedings uh, that could carry the death penalty. And despite his best efforts, uh, he was very firmly in the minority with the majority reaffirming the, the fact that the common law evolves incrementally and on the basis of existing principles. And that's one of uh, the issues that we confront with the common law as a means of rights protection. There's no doubt that the common law offers uh, rights protection to a number of core civil and political rights but its evolution is tempered by this approach, which does not marry up with uh, the living instrument approach that we see with the European Convention. Uh, and a number of other cases recently, including Begum, Friends of the Earth Limited, go to show that one of the objectives of the, the Human Rights Act, which was to increase rights awareness, has certainly been effective. Uh, we see a number of rights challenges uh, creeping into different areas. Um, but those cases were unsuccessful in terms of rights protection uh, if we are measuring them by a standard of how, uh, how successful an applicant may be. But nevertheless, they do offer, I think, uh, very valid proof that the Human Rights Act and its quotes incorporation of the European Convention has worked nicely alongside the common law to facilitate some degree of evolution. But we still find ourselves in a position where questions abound as to whether the common law could in fact uh, offer the same degree of protection should it be necessary uh, of the rights that we find enshrined in the European Convention. So I'll keep it to that because of the techno technological difficulties and I do sincerely apologise and thank you all for your patience with that. Thanks very much Stevie and we're sorry you've had those difficulties all of us after a year of Zoom you know that they're a not horrible thing to happen. So I'm going to start with some of the questions and then just to say to people who are attending please do use the Q&A button if you want to put questions this afternoon. We ha also have gathered some questions uh, from before the session, so we'll, I'll be picking some of those up as well. But the first one that I want to put is uh, one that is in the Q&A, and that is the HRA pr provision that a court is a public authority has been taken to mean that courts cannot enforce rules of the common law considered to be incompatible with the con convention rights. 
But the questioner says some common law rules are of longer standing and arguably more fundamental than anything to be found in statute. Is it not wise to give them the same protection against judicial striking down? Um, so, Sir Peter, I don't know if you would, would like to respond to that. What I'm going to do is give panelists a chance as well, but we'd particularly like to give members of the IRR panel an opportunity to respond first to questions. Uh, Chair, thank you very much indeed. Um, what an interesting question. Uh, no, I wouldn't regard common law rights as being... Oops. If that echo is coming from me, I'm sorry. Um, I wouldn't regard the common law rights as being in any way undermined or relegated by Section 6. Uh, I don't see it in that way. Nor do I see Section 6 uh, as necessarily requiring slavish adherence to wherever convention rights are at any point in time. And I think if one looks at how the courts have dealt with section two uh, over a period of time, you can see a greater readiness to assert a UK perspective, which I think, and I, I speak personally, uh, very healthy. Uh, if one said that there was always the need for unanimity on every, or identity between our courts and Strasbourg, uh, then there would be no prospect for the dialogue uh, that is clearly envisaged as well. It is true that if there is a gap, as I re reflected earlier, or too much of a gap, then one is running counter to one of the objectives of the act, though one may bear that from time to time with relative calm, albeit it puts the UK in an interesting position uh, in this realm of international relations, which is different from the individual case. But no, I see a, a very important role for the common law in all this uh, in the same way, dare I use the term mutatis mutandis, uh, as other convention states all have fixed protections. Uh, the obvious way of our approaching this convention, speaking personally, uh, is that you start with a common law and then take into account the Strasbourg jurisprudence. That's a rather longer answer than I was hoping for. May I just say when expressing any view today, it is personal. Uh, and the reason for that is I have an independent panel. So I have absolutely no idea whether any view I express commands any, and if so, what support from those here, let alone those who are not here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sir Peter. And I'm going to ask members of the panel if they'd like to speak, or panelists, if you could use the raise your hand function. Yes, hello, Simon Davis. I can see you'd like to say something. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I mean, to, to an extent, of course, as, all, as always, as Sir Peter has stolen sort of much of, of certainly my thunder, but I, I think the right way of looking at it is perhaps the way which Professor Steve Martin has already put it, which is not so much a question is the common law and uh, the conventional rights, are they in some way in conflict? But the real question is, is, a, is how they are complementary to each other and how they, how they fit in both. And I think the best, and I think the concern which was raised in a number of the submissions uh, and uh, in, indeed by the Supreme Court uh, itself in Osborne, uh, is whether what has been happening, and still now, uh, to an extent, do the courts leap straight to looking at Strasbourg jurisprudence, with common law then being an afterthought, or, or do they start, as a number of commentators have suggested that, that they should, start to see whether the common law addresses the particular problem in issue, and then turns to look and see, all right, well, to the extent that there are possible gaps in the common law, as Professor Eakin said was the point of the act to, to deal with it, to the extent there's a gap, how are those addressed now looking at Strasbourg jurisprudence? So I think you will find, put it in mind in a short way, is common law first in terms of timing of being addressed rather than common law first in terms of primacy over convention rights. Thank you very much. A any other comments from the panel, Sir Stephen? Uh, thank you. I can't find a, a, a raise my hand button, so um, I'm waving, um, not drowning. Um, 
I, I think there were a couple of points I wanted to make. One, one more general uh, about framing the discussion we're having, uh, which is, um, I'm, a, I'm a drafter, I'm used to approaching legal problems with the basis that there is no single thing that is a fixed point. Uh, our terms of reference are a fixed point, but our terms of reference do not require us to answer the question, does the Human Rights Act do what it intended to do in the best possible way. It is about how that the act works independently of what it was trying to do in the first place. So I, I just want, as the first two sessions, uh, um, first two sets of comments rather started from the proposition of what it, it was intended to do. That's very important. We, we recognize those objectives, but that isn't the end of the question for us. Uh, on the question of the, uh, the common law, uh, it, it's true the common law has values that um, it's important should be taken into account in uh, deciding what people's human rights are. And some of those are the values of the rule of law, which in some ways are uh, ha have a tension with, uh, for example, the dynamic nature of uh, human rights law that uh, Rich Professor Eakins um, explained. Uh, and, but you can't get away from the fact that the common law is subject to statute law because of the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty and that uh, then the Human Rights Act comes in after that because it, it enables the courts to um, declare uh, acts of parliament incompatible with the Human Rights Act. So um, as Simon said, it's a question of timing rather than a, a question of priority because the priority um, going upwards is always going to be a common law statute, uh, the, the convention, uh, and uh, you're stuck with that and you have to work out what is the best way to deal with it. Um, I think that's probably enough to say at the moment. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who'd like to comment on this question? I should add that one of the questions we received from uh, members of the panel began also related to the question of the common law, and that was whether fundamental human rights should not be subject to the will of government, but should be protected through the common law constitution. And I don't know whether there's anybody who'd like to respond to that question, along with thinking about the other issues relating to the common law that have been raised. Okay, not seeing anybody. Yeah, well, uh, as, as a person that's well known to support the idea of the, the, the um, common law constitution, Constitution, maybe I ought to say something on that. Uh, I, I, I think the common law constitution is very, very important. Uh, and part of a, a sort of statutory intervention with the common law constitution is section 19. Uh, I think one of the greatest effects of the uh, Human Rights Act on the legislative uh, scheme of things ha has been the impact of section 19, because uh, I can say, I, I think with some um, authority that before uh, 1998, when Section 19 came into force, a bit earlier than everything else, um, the consideration to given in by people preparing legislation to the Human Rights Act was not very structured or organised. And the uh, consequence of Section 19 is that it is now, uh, almost 10 years since I retired, but I'm sure things haven't changed since then, it is now a, a um, a, a structured part of the preparation of legislation and is taken extremely seriously uh, in Parliament, the J not only in the JCHR, but, but generally and within government. And that is the, the political constitution working to protect human rights um, uh, uh, so that acts when they are passed have had very uh, detailed consideration of their human rights impacts. I mean, just on that point, uh, Sir Stephen, one of the questions is whether you think that Section 19 is in itself sufficient to ensure that new legislation is compliant with ECHR obligations. That's a slightly different proposition to the one that you were making. I mean, do, you, do you think it is a sufficient mechanism for the protection of, of ECHR rights? You're muted. Sir. You're on mute. I hadn't. Muted myself, so I tried to unmute myself. Um, I, I think uh, it is a very important contribution to ensuring that human rights are considered when legislation is passed. And I think human rights are uh, probably better understood if they are given the detail that is provided when they're put into legislation. So um, it's, uh, I think it's important for two two reasons. First of all, because it makes the political institutions think hard about human rights when they're legislating. Uh, and secondly, because uh, it is uh, 
a, a way in which um, human rights can be given more crystallization in statute rather than having to wait until they're crystallized by decisions of the courts. Thank you very much. So we're coming to the end of this session. I'm just going to look at both members of the IRR panel and panelists to see if there's anybody who'd like to comment on any of these issues, particularly relating to the to the common law. And in that, I notice a question has just come in commenting on the historical inadequacy of the common law, for example, in relation to protecting equality rights. So if there's anybody who'd like to comment on that, yes, Simon Davis. As, uh, happily, happily or unhappily, I'm, I'm a, a question behind. Uh, and in fact, I can take the opportunity of, of turning this back, back onto the, the, the more learned panel, uh, which is in relation to the role of section 19. Uh, because clearly Parliament is sovereign. It passed the Act, it knew what it was doing when it gave a particular job uh, to the, the courts. Um, but the question now is, I think, bearing in mind a number of the submissions, but particularly the one from the Faculty of Law of Cambridge, is should Parliament be doing more at the Section 19 stage? So whether, you're, whether the courts later are trying to find the grain or whichever particular case you want to look at, and, I, and certainly in section, sorry, sorry, paragraph 33 of the, the faculty's submission says that perhaps the Joint Committee on Human Rights could write reports on salient issues within the margin of appreciation. So I'd quite like, if, you, if, I, if I may, to turn it back to certainly Cambridge or indeed Oxford to see, do we, is there a, a suggestion uh, or a case for Parliament doing more at the section 19 stage uh, to assist the courts and indeed to flag to Europe in the context of marginal appreciation, how Parliament has grappled with certain issues. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Stevie or Mark or somebody from Cambridge? Yes, Stevie. Uh, certainly, I think in terms of the CPL submission, that was uh, definitely our, our perspective was that we could be doing more at that point uh, in, in terms of that dialogue that was seen as so crucial and indeed is crucial between our courts and uh, Strasbourg and also between our, our parliament and Strasbourg. I think it would go a long way to the margin of appreciation application if there was greater discussion about how these issues have been canvassed um, and why this particular legislative provision has been enacted, notwithstanding perhaps the challenges that have been made under the, uh, the European Convention. Anybody else who'd like to respond to that question? I'd, yes. like, I'd like, to, if I may, a follow up. Do, do you mean, Dr. Martin, at the stage of section 19, what, what more would you do? I think having mm. spent a career seeing the law from the other end, mm. normally when things have gone badly wrong, uh, my perspective is inevitably influenced. And I rather wonder how much more could usefully be said mm. at the section 19 stage. Mm that would be of practical use when as inevitably happens, something turns up which no one has thought of before. The challenge for the common law, uh, which is why it develops incrementally, uh, is because it adjusts to circumstances which change. That's why it's not ossified and commands such worldwide support. But going back to your, your point in section 19, um, what more could or should be done? I'm not against it. Mm. But I'm not expressing a view on that question at all. Mm. Uh, but I'm just interested to know what one might have in mind. Certainly, and I think Professor Young has put her hand up and this might be actually somewhere where I defer, defer to the expert a bit here, so I might. <laughs> Thanks, Stevie. Thanks. We'll turn to Alison, yes. Thank you. Um, so if I can just sort of clarify some of the points that we made, I think links into this. It's um, what we're thinking about with regard to section 19 and also other areas depends on the stage that you're at. So you're absolutely right to recognize that it wouldn't be possible in a section 19 statement to set out every single possible way in which a broad piece of legislation might reach convention rights, because as we all know, it's very difficult at the general stage to predict every single circumstance, circumstances change, and a general rule that looks perfectly compatible with human rights can in specific circumstances then be seen to be incompatible. And we do need the courts at that stage to be able to pick these up. 
I think what we're thinking about more generally at the Section 19 stage is picking up on what happens in other jurisdictions, where you don't just have a general statement from a minister that something is or is not generally compatible with convention rights. So we're used to a general statement that says, as far as we are aware, this is compatible with convention rights. But I think more could be done then to explain why it's compatible and also in certain areas where there might be questions or issues about in potential incompatibilities, how you, these have been discussed and evaluated. And sometimes those are picked up on uh, JCHR reports, sometimes they are not. And so I think something that also has elements of reasoning could, that could then cause um, ability for Parliament to discuss those reasons and also to evaluate how they determine the convention right in certain circumstances might be quite useful. Um, a second issue we were thinking about to do with the margin of appreciation is something that will come up in my particular talk in the next session. So I'll defer on that issue uh, when I talk later. Thanks, Alison. And I think time now requires us to move on. So uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Steve and Richard for their presentations and for the interesting questions that have come from the floor. We're now going to turn to the second panel for today, which is going to look in particular at the theme relating to the relationship between the UK courts and the European Court of Human Rights. And again, um, Alison is going to start off there for five minutes. Thank you. So um, what I'm going to be doing is looking at the relationship between UK courts and the European Court of Human Rights by looking more specifically at domestic courts. And then Professor Fredman will move on to examine this from the perspective of the Strasbourg Court. And I want to make four points quite quickly. So my first two points are quite positive, focusing on the way in which I think domestic courts at the moment do facilitate effective dialogue with Strasbourg. And then my second two points are going to suggest possible further changes that might be able to facilitate this di dialogue more effectively. So first, um, as we know, the UK courts do take account of decisions of the Strasbourg Court when they're interpreting convention rights and they do follow clear and consistent case law. And I think this is a very good feature because it enables courts to work together to provide a protection of rights that are uncontroversial and agreed across Europe. So things like the right to a fair trial, protecting freedom of expression and protecting rights against discrimination. And I also think this is very effective because it ensures that rights are brought home. So the purposes of the HRA are fulfilled and we make sure that that core minimum protection of rights at the international arena, the European arena, is protecting the UK without having to go to Strasbourg. Second, that although UK courts do take account of relevant case law, I think it's important to recognise that this is not slavish. They don't just slavishly follow decisions of the Strasbourg court. So we have examples of where domestic courts don't follow decisions if there are misunderstandings or errors in the Strasbourg court's reasoning, either as to the particular situation in the UK or because they're more generic uh, flaws in the reasoning process. And this enables domestic courts to correct what's going on in Strasbourg. And you find there's a good interaction between UK courts and Strasbourg courts looking at those different aspects of rights. And we also find situations in domestic, which domestic courts do provide stronger protections of rights than those found in Strasbourg. And again, this is good in the areas of margins of appreciation because it allows UK courts to develop a UK sensitive protection of rights. But I think it's important to recognise that the UK courts do this in a manner that reflects their proper constitutional role. So they're very sensitive to not moving in areas which they see as more suited to political decision making as we've seen in things like aspects of um, the rights of um, assisted suicide. And we've also seen it in situations where UK courts might be more willing to develop rights in those areas, either when they're following a line of direction from Strasbourg, so in things like non-discrimination rights, on sexual orientation issues, and in those instances where they are, can't see a clear line or where they think it's more suited to Parliament, then the UK courts are much more willing to then incrementally develop the common law to supplement convention rights. I think all these features provide a really good way of ensuring a stronger protection of rights, but in a way that is sensitive to the UK's particular cultural situation and furthering the development of a UK culture of rights protections. Nevertheless, I want to suggest two areas where I think dialogue might not work effectively and where changes might be possible or might need to be taken into account. 
So the first is that whilst it's important to ensure that UK courts can interact with Strasbourg decisions, I think it's important to make sure that UK courts don't have the ability to disagree with Strasbourg just because they would have decided it differently. I think there are two problems with this. It might mean that UK courts do not provide that minimum protection of rights, and so rights are not brought home. And second, I think if you develop in this way without domestic courts focusing on the reasoning of the Strasbourg courts, it will lose that element of mutual respect between the courts that allows Strasbourg to listen to domestic courts and so therefore have a very fruitful dialogue between the two courts. And second is to pick up on the issue that came up earlier, which is the extent to which within the margin of appreciation in those areas where it's not suited for the UK courts to develop rights, could there be a way of ensuring that Parliament is able within the margin of appreciation to think more carefully about how the UK might want to provide a strong protection of rights in those areas? And this is where I think perhaps having an ability for the Joint Committee of Human Rights to look at those particular issues, to perhaps even have the ability to prompt debate, as we saw the committee, um, the European Scrutiny Committee empowered to do so under the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act, so they can actually get these issues onto the political agenda because we are aware of just how busy Parliament is, and so sometimes these issues can be overlooked. So I'll now hand over to Sandy. Thanks, Alison. Uh, Sandy. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. And I'd like to also express my appreciation to the panel and to everyone who organized this for these great ideas of roadshows, which are so essential to keeping uh, the, di um, the dynamic nature of human rights and human rights protection. So Alison has spoken about the relationship between UK courts and the European court from the perspective of UK courts. And I'm going to speak briefly about the European Court of Human Rights. And I want to make three main points. The first is that the European Court of Human Rights is a cautious court. It is aware that as a regional court, it stands at the confluence of many different constitutional and human rights traditions. It exercises its caution in several ways, as is familiar with, with everyone. It allows a margin of appreciation to domestic authorities where it regards domestic authorities as better placed to assess the social context in which convention rights should be applied. This means that interpretations given to convention rights by domestic authorities, which includes domestic courts, are respected. Where relevant, the court will also look at the practice of European states, partly to determine whether there is a consensus on the interpretation of the right. At the same time as being cautious, and this is my second point, the court has its clear bright lines in enforcing human rights, and it will hold states to be in breach of convention rights if they overstep these bright lines. This is right and appropriate, um, and it, it should be said again, although perhaps obvious, democracy is not only about majoritarian rights, as we saw to our cost in Nazi Germany, which gave rise to the European Convention eventually, the result of the war, I should say. Democracy includes protections for individual rights, and it is precisely when majorities override these rights that human rights protections are needed. Clearly, legislatures and governments have the primary responsibility for respecting these rights, but when they do not, courts are needed to intervene. So where the European court regards the right as being infringed, the margin of appreciation is rightly narrow. A good example of both the court's respect for domestic authorities and its bright lines for intervention is the operation of Article 14, which requires states to ensure the enjoyment of convention rights without discrimination on a range of grounds, including sex, race, and religion. Where the court regards an issue as falling within a state's economic and social policy, it will grant a wide margin of appreciation so that a measure might only be regarded as breaching the convention right if it is manifestly without reasonable foundation. That is the caution of the court. On the other hand, if the issue discriminates on one of the core grounds, which include race, sex, disability, sexual orientation, then it will subject the measure to searching scrutiny. I think everyone would acknowledge that non-discrimination on grounds of race, gender, disability, sexual orientation are necessary in any democratic state. 
if legislative majorities respect these rights, then of course, that's how we would hope it to be. It's when they don't that we do need judicial human rights protections for courts to back them up. And this is a public good, which is necessary for democracy. My third point is to acknowledge that the interpretation of human rights is often not straightforward. This is particularly so when it is clear that there has been an interference with the right, but the state argues that it's justified in limiting it. The balance between the breach of the right and the public policy justifications for breaching it is difficult to draw. This is even more so when the state says the breach of one right is necessary to respect a different one. However, um, the European Court of Human Rights does not operate simply on its own whim in doing these balancing. It has to apply the terms of the European Convention, which states throughout Europe have signed and ratified. The European Convention, for example, requires that an interference with some of the key rights, such as speech, assembly and religion, can only be justified when necessary in the interests of a democratic society for a range of specified purposes. And this commitment to a democratic society runs through uh, the center of the European Convention. So the European Court is just as accountable to the text of the Convention as member states and domestic courts. Its application of the Convention to the many cases which have come before it from the UK has demonstrated both its respect for the need for deference where appropriate to domestic authorities and the bright lines which states should not cross. When these are contested, as they often are, the court has remained open to further evolution. Its relationship with the UK and particularly UK courts has consistently exemplified this. So in conclusion, I'd, I'd say that courts resolution of these difficult issues will by definition often not please governments, which might prefer to operate without human rights restraints. When governments disagree with the outcome of a human rights decision before a court, they might find it politically opposite to characterize it as judicial interference, particularly where this is a, a European court, such as the European Court of Human Rights. But this does not argue for removing human rights or human rights protections from courts, it argues for ongoing accountability of governments for their human rights decisions, first and primarily to legislatures, but if not, then to courts, including the European Court. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sandy. And just to remind people who are uh, listening to the webinar, please do use the Q&A function. I will be identifying questions that particularly pertain to the terms of reference of the panel. Um, so if you think your question has been answered, it's because uh, it does seem to potentially go beyond the terms of reference or alternatively we run out of time. Um, I want to go back to a couple of questions that were sparked off by the section 19 conversation because it did seem to me that members of the panel were interested in those and might want an opportunity to comment on them or to hear further about them. Um, so the first one related to the timing of the section 19 uh, process and that is that uh, whether it should apply not just to the bill as presented in uh, when it is read for the first time in Parliament, but also to any amendments during passage, because it be, could, could become quite irrelevant if the amendments are quite sweeping. Um, in fact, I see actually both of, the, both of the questions relate to that. So I don't know, uh, so Stephen, I can see you've got your hand up. You may would like to respond to that. Yes, the section 19 statement is required when the bill is introduced into the first house. And it is uh, required when the bill transfers to the second house. Uh, and there are procedures within government uh, that ensure that if uh, the government uh, introduced or acceded to an amendment in the second house that it thought was incompatible with human rights, it's uh, an obligation under the ministerial code for the minister in charge of the bill to notify the house of that fact. So, um, I, I mean, it's true that there is no statement uh, after the bill has passed the second house uh, but it, 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 the, the procedures are in place to cover amendments. Um, there's an issue perhaps about whether those are the appropriate procedures, but there are procedures in place for that. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else on uh, either amongst the members of the panel or the panelists who'd like to comment on that uh, section 19 process in response to the questions that we've had? 
uh, Sir Peter did mention it at the outset, but that was the question of devolution and the issues relating to Northern Ireland in particular, um, which was raised there. And I'm not quite sure if the panel members would like to perhaps uh, comment on their views in relation to how the issues around devolution uh, should uh, affect their deliberations or are affecting their deliberations on the issues before them. Very briefly, um, we are alive to the sensitivities to the different landscape and the different uh, devolved uh, nations, uh, the particular features of Scottish law as it now is, the features of the uh, Good Friday Agreement there we have with us Professor Carhill, who has a wonderful perspective from the other side of the border and how matters are very calmly addressed in the Republic of Ireland in this regard. Uh, and we are, of course, alive to very strong feelings in Wales on the same topics, uh, even though it is not a separate jurisdiction. Uh, so what I've been very anxious to say without, again, expressing any sort of conclusion, uh, is that we, we have well in mind that uh, any conclusions to which we come uh, may need to be tested or benchmarked against how they would work or play uh, in, say, Scotland or Northern Ireland. Uh, we are not simply trampling our way through the territory covered by the terms of reference without regard for that. And I should make it clear we have uh, a Scottish professor, Tom Mullen, who many here may know, who is a member of the panel. We have Baroness O'Lone, who's well known in, uh, from, and from Northern Ireland, who's a member of our panel. And we have had road shows in Belfast, uh, Swansea and Glasgow. And we will also, in fact, be having a round table in Dublin. All, all I'm afraid virtually, it's a great shame. Uh, but uh, options for travel have been rather diminished. So I hope that helps uh, on that topic. Sometime when I get a chance, I've got a question for Professor Eakins, but it could come after others have spoken. Right, well, we'll, we'll take Sir so Stephen now, who's indicating, and perhaps then Sir Peter will come back to you so you can pose your question to, to Richard Eakins. Sir so, so Stephen. I, I just wanted to add, we've had some interesting meetings in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, and the particular feature of the devolved landscape is that uh, compatibility with the Human Rights Convention is an aspect of legislative competence. And that means uh, that the devolves have a particularly particular experience and uh, perspective on uh, compatibility, which is not shared in England. And we're very conscious of that too. Thank you very much for, for that clarification. And uh, I think we'll come back to you then, Sir Peter, for you to put your question to, 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 to Richard Eakins. Just unmuting. Um, Professor Eakins in the policy exchange report said some things about the margin of appreciation. I wasn't entirely sure I followed. It's probably, it's assuredly my fault. Uh, how Professor Eakins uh, would like to change anything if he would. As I see it, the margin of appreciation is something which Strasbourg accepts, is granted to all convention states to apply what may be universal principles, but in a manner which may well differ depending on national policy, sensitivity and so on. But for each nation state, who does the application depends on its own domestic institutions. In our case, as I've always understood it, it's a matter for mutual respect between the three branches of state. Uh, and that requires, as I said, mutual respect between each of the branches. Uh, I'm not sure if you said anything which differs from that. If you did, I'm very keen to understand what it is you are saying about it. Um, so I can think about it. Richard. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, um, I'm assuming you're referring, Sir Peter, to, um, uh, to my submission to the, uh, with John Lark and QC to the panel, uh, which we, we do certainly speak to this point. Yes, yeah. Uh, so I think my concern, which I think is shared by um, a number of other jurists, including to some extent 
from his public writings years ago, at least uh, um, Lord Sales, as you know, is, is a concern that uh, when, the, when one is within the margin of appreciation, uh, the UK would not be found in breach of, um, of the convention by, by Strasbourg. Uh, and at that point, um, UK courts operating under the Human Rights Act shouldn't be able to find uh, UK policy or, or law uh, legislation enacted by parliament or, or secondary legislation in breach of convention rights uh, in accordance with the Human Rights Act. And I think, I mean, I do have a, a I think a disagreement here with, um, uh, well, maybe, maybe I do, maybe I don't, with some of what um, Alison Young was suggesting uh, to the extent of whether courts should be, UK courts should be developing uh, a sort of British variation on, on convention rights in the space in which the UK would not be in breach. And I do disagree uh, if that's, I mean, it's not, not, it doesn't be Alison's claim, but certainly someone's, uh, Lady Hales to some extent. Uh, I think that is a feature of the Human Rights Act's development since uh, in Regi in 2008, a major feature. Uh, um, and I think it's incompatible with uh, the act as enacted to my mind. But in any case, uh, I can see the rationale as I've, as I've um, said elsewhere, I think in the, in the submission for uh, conceiving of the Human Rights Act as a way to minimize the, the uh, number of breaches uh, that we're likely to be found to be in before Strasbourg. But I think the act has been, is being developed and has been developed into something that goes further than that. And I have a concern, so my concern isn't just with what Strasbourg may do in some cases, well, I do have that concern, but that British courts may, uh, may use the machinery of the Human Rights Act um, to, to go further than, uh, than they should be permitted to do so when that pressing foreign policy imperative is, is absent. Uh, and I think the Human Rights Act should be amended um, accordingly. Uh, thanks, Richard. I see Alison would like to respond. Thank you, Kate. Um, yes, you're right, Richard, we do disagree, but that's, that's one of the nice things about the Roadshow is that we can put different views of, across and allow the panel to go away and reflect on them and adapt them. Um, so yes, I think what we're disputing about is what do you mean by the purposes of Human Rights Act to be bringing rights home? And the way in which I think you're interpreting that is that the aim of the Human Rights Act is to ensure that the UK upholds its international obligations without people having to go to Strasbourg. And that's one interpretation of the purposes of the Act. I think also another element of the purpose of the Act is to ensure that we can bring the rights home to the UK for when it's constitutionally suitable for the courts to develop those rights within the margin of appreciation for the courts to do so, as well as Parliament being able to further develop those rights within the margin of appreciation as well. And I think that's also a legitimate part of what the Human Rights Act is about. And I think for the most part, courts have done this in a way that is sensitive to their proper constitutional role, as we did see in cases like Nicholson on the right to assisted suicide. So I think, yes, we are disagreeing, and it's about what is the purpose of bringing rights home. Thanks very much, Alison. And I see Sandy as well. Sandy. Um, yes, um, thanks so much, Kate. Um, I, I, I wanted to add to what both Alison, what Alison said, but also, uh, agree with Sir Peter's interpretation of the margin of appreciation, which is that the, the idea is that the court as a regional court is not always best placed to decide how uh, the convention should be applied in the specific context of the, the many different states to which it applies. And the margin of appreciation specifically get, uh, pushes or moves that uh, decision-making to domestic authorities who are better placed. And as I said, that includes domestic courts. There's a separate, I think, very separate doctrine of deference, which is how domestic courts organ, uh, should see their relationship with the other branches, the executive and the legislature. And there are times in which uh, the courts should appropriately be deferent, but the margin of appreciation does, does say that the interpretation of convention rights should and can lie with domestic courts. And that is the appropriate way in which this interaction between a regional court and uh, very differing domestic courts should operate. So I think the way in which uh, margin appreciation works is to put the decision-making power with domestic authorities about the interpretation and application of convention rights, not to say that uh, that the end of the matter and they do not have jurisdiction. 
Thanks, Sandy. So, so Peter, your question has uh, sparked a lively engagement. I also see there's an, uh, um, an, another question here from a constitutional lawyer directed at Professor Eakins, which is what provision of the HRA he thinks um, prohibits the judicial development of human rights law within the margin of appreciation. And because you've, um, you've elicited such a lively response, Richard, I thought I'd give you a quick right of reply on all of this. And Simon Davis, I see, also has a question. Simon, do you want to come in before Richard uh, um, has a right of reply? Because uh, he, it, it, we'll, we'll give him that and then we might move on to the next panel. We'll see unless another question comes up. Um, perhaps I'll go for it because it may, may be relevant to Richard's um, uh, response on this, because to the extent that there is a, a lively debate about to what extent the courts should be following, UK courts should be following, say, a grand chamber decision. I think my question for, for everybody is, uh, is there any help that Parliament can give our courts, or is the, the position satisfactory at the moment? And the particular example I have in mind is the Hallam case, where Lord Reid dissenting says unequivocally that in circumstances where there is an authoritative grand chamber decision or a clear and constant line of authority, there is no room for dialogue, none, because that is the, uh, the position. Whereas others appear to be saying that so long as there is a good reason for the dissenting or, or disagreeing with the Grand Chamber decision, applying Strasbourg jurisprudence, looking at it and just consider the Grand Chamber's got it wrong, there's nothing wrong in that. So there seems to be at our highest levels, a lack of clarity. And I'm just wondering, is there anything that we should be asking Parliament to do about that? Uh, thanks, Simon. So that also raises an important issue. We're going to give Richard an opportunity to respond. Maria, I see that you've come in. Would you like to put your question first? Sorry, I uh, overlooked your hand for a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. It was actually a, a question I had in mind. There's so much going on today that um, everything's coming from different angles. But I had in mind to ask Alison when she mentioned the importance of, of reasoning um, in the decisions being given both on both sides from domestic courts and, and from the court and the, the reasoning process itself, itself can help to, to increase the legitimacy of the outcomes that are achieved and, and that was certainly a theme that came through in one of the submissions received by the panel from um, Professor Jason Varohas um, and I think something that, that maybe we can reflect on with profit um, and, and it links actually to something that Professor um, Fredman mentioned that that Strasbourg will often articulate clear, bright lines, and and um, Jason's argument is that that often when it does so, it does so in a declaratory way, and so there can be a lack of normative depth to the argument that's coming forward. Um, and if domestic courts then just take those judgments from the ECHR and sort of <laughs> uh, put them into their own domestic judgments without a lot of normative scaffolding and, and scaffolding of reasoning. Um, there can be a lack of quality to the to the arguments that are being had and the discussions that are being had, which maybe undermine um, the legitimacy and the authority with which the rights are being articulated and vindicated. So I, I wanted to to see what what somebody might respond to that, um, and sort of relatedly to see how we might think about um, the way in which the the Strasbourg Court articulates to us as all contracting states that we should be the ones to take primary responsibility for the uh, protection of fundamental rights and that the Strasbourg court should be the subsidiary mechanism for doing so. Um, so, so some thoughts that I'm sort of throwing into the mix of the soup of things that we are now discussing. No, I think those are all very important. So I'm gonna go back to Richard to the question of the margin of appreciation and the question of whether UK courts can uh, develop an approach within the margin of appreciation that might be different or in some way more extensive human rights protection than Strasbourg would require. Richard, you picked up all the comments. Do you want to respond to that? Uh, sure, I won't, I won't take them all on, but um, uh, I think my answer is, is a proper understanding of section two, I think, as it was intended by, by Parliament in 1998. Uh, and I think I've, I think this, um, uh, good support in, in um, much learning commentary for uh, that position, as you say, Lord Sales, um, Sir Patrick Elias, or Lord Justice Elias, as he then wants, taking a similar line. Uh, um, and I, I think Simon Davis is right that there is a, there's a bit of a mess in our highest courts on this, on this point. Uh, um, oh, well, a range of points. How far can our superior highest courts disagree with, uh, with Strasbourg? How far are they bound by a clear line of authority? Uh, um, and how far are they free within the margin of appreciation to 
uh, to develop a, a, a judicial variation. And I think, um, uh, I mean, Professor Friedman uh, referred to it being domestic authorities that have uh, a seized of the margin appreciation, which is true, I think, but that very quickly does turn into domestic courts. That's uh, often how it's discussed because um, once one's within the margin appreciation, the a domestic court is free uh, to, to develop a, a local variation. And that, no breach of the convention, but nothing wrong, I think, with the act being amended. So it's, it's parliament and uh, um, uh, government that have primary responsibility or entire responsibility. I think the Nicholson case is, is, a, is a total mess, really. Uh, I mean, I agree with some of what's said in passing in it, um, not just in passing, but it, um, it shows a, a real standing problem, I think, in, in how our courts understand their position when uh, the UK would not be in, in breach of Strasbourg. Thanks, Richard. And then I'm going to go to Alison to respond potentially to uh, Simon Davis's question, also to Maria Cahill's one. Um, thanks, Kate. I'll try my best to be quick. Um, with regards to Maria Cahill's problem, I think what um, we're pointing out is that the way in which the European Court of Human Rights reasons and the way in which we're used to reasoning in the common law are not necessarily the same thing. And I think that means sometimes there can be confusion as to where the reasoning comes from, how judges are reached. And we also have to be very careful that the European Court of Human Rights is taking a decision on a specific breach, on a specific set of circumstances from which we might try and draw um, principles going forward, but it doesn't, do, doesn't reason in exactly the same way as the common law. So when we're talking about engaging with the reasoning process, I think we have each court has to be respectful of the other, not just disagree for no real reason, but be able to engage effectively with an understanding that they might reason in different ways. And that has to be taken account of when we're thinking about how the two might interact. Uh, with regard to um, Simon Davis's question, I, I wish I knew the, the million dollar answer here. Um, I think one of the difficulties is whenever we want an indication from Parliament is timing. I think it's very difficult for Parliament to be able to give um, answers to these things in a very quick and specific way as to whether you should follow a grand chamber decision or not. It's also going to depend on whether it's specifically addressed to the UK or not. So whether it triggers international um, law obligations or not in those circumstances. I think the best I can think of is in exactly the same way that the Joint um, Committee on Human Rights will look at uh, report on decisions that have been decided against the UK. I think in those situations that again could prompt political debate in particular areas if it was felt the government wanted to intervene in certain situations or parliament wanted to give a clearer steer. Thanks very much, Alison. And we've got another question which I'm just going to pose and then we're going to move straight on to the next panel. And I see Sandy, your hand, but perhaps you can just hold that for um, when we've done the next panel, we'll have a kind of sweep up at the end. Um, so the question I want to put on the table um, is the question of the way in which the Strasbourg jurisprudence has developed over the last decade as encouraged by the UK government, says the questioner, so that if national authorities carefully apply convention rights, the court is much more likely to grant a margin of appreciation. So the, I think the careful is both procedural and substantive, and whether amending the HRA might jeopardize the, as it were, that kind of respect and deference that has emerged under that new approach from Strasbourg. So that's just for everyone to think about for a minute or two while we turn to panel three, and we can then pick all of these things up uh, in the discussion on panel three. So in, in here we're now going to turn to the second major theme of the um, terms of reference, which is the relationship between the three arms of government within the UK itself, uh, particularly as evidenced in sections three and four of the HRA. And uh, on that, we're going to start with Nick Friedman from Cambridge. Nick. Just trying to find the unmute button. Thanks very much, Kate. And thanks to the ministry and to Mark Richard and Daniel for putting this event together. What I'd like to do for a few minutes is focus on section three of the HRA, whether it requires courts to perform executive or legislative functions, and whether that's problematic from a separation of powers perspective. Now to begin with, it's notoriously difficult to define what is properly a legislative or judicial function. And comparative study shows that there are many different and reasonable ways of delineating and allocating functions between the branches. Moreover, the mere fact of overlap between these functions is not inherently bad. It's often a good thing 
It prevents abuses of power and ensures collaboration and dialogue. It can also be expedient, as with the wide ranging legislative powers, including primary legislative powers given to the executive branch. So there must be some specific problem with the particular overlap under the HRA. That problem can't just be the judges sometimes make law or impact policy, because this is at the core of what judges do, even in private law contexts, when they develop the common law or interpret legislation. Now, some people see the problem as one of degree. And here I would say that judges are often quite good at seeing when their decisions would be too far reaching. And this is why it's important, I think, to focus not on one or two controversial cases, but to look at human rights adjudication in the round. But even in controversial cases like Gaidan, the degree is quite limited. So the court there didn't ask, you know, what should our country do about rental housing? Parliament already came up with that scheme. The court didn't ask, should we give special treatment to cohabiting couples? Parliament already answered that in the scheme. The court didn't ask, should we prevent discrimination against gay people? Parliament answered that by passing the HRA. So this wasn't a case of wide ranging policy options triggering polycentric considerations. The court was faced with a narrow question, holding everything else about the statutory scheme constant should we incrementally extend a statutory tenancy to cover gay cohabiting couples? And the court did that in a context where parliament had already passed legislation allowing gay adoption and was then currently considering a civil partnership bill. So what this case highlights is how parliament and courts have different institutional advantages, different processes, different political incentives that allow them to collaborate and coordinate on questions about rights. Some people see the problem as a problem of kind, that the HRA involves the courts in contentious issues of immigration and crime and religious concerns like gay rights or abortion. But the beauty of the British system compared to places with entrenched constitutions is that parliament already has the power with a simple majority to undo any judicial interpretation in these areas. So if the problem is with specific points of concern rather than human rights adjudication overall, then it would be better, I think, for parliament to target these substantive concerns directly rather than amend the HRA itself. As it happens, parliament tends not to disturb the human rights rulings of the courts. Now, perhaps that's because MPs are generally content with those rulings, even if they sometimes have to pretend that they're not. Or it might be that Parliament, for whatever reason, lacks the capacity to reliably assert its will on these kinds of human rights concerns. And if that's the case, then I'm quite worried about arguments suggesting that Parliament's human rights burdens should increase still further and that our human rights protections by default and in general should be left entirely to parliament's vigilance. Now, there's of course lots more to say on all these points, but I'll leave it there for now and I'd be happy to come back to any of this during the discussion. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Nick. And now we'll turn to Timothy Endicott. Timothy. Thank you, I will say ditto to Nick Friedman's thanks to everyone and, and uh, let me add my best wishes to the members of the panel on, on your work. I'm going to talk about the implications of section four of the Human Rights Act for the relationship between the judiciary, the executive and, and the legislature. There's a connection between what Nick had to say and what I will have to say. And it, it, it's the point that Nick made that parliament tends not to disturb human rights rulings. So uh, I may come back to that, the importance of that connection. In the first 20 years of the Human Rights Act, there were 29 declarations of incompatibility by UK courts that were not overturned on appeal and where the process of consideration in government was complete. In 20 of those cases, the incompatibility identified by the court was removed by ordinary legislation. In eight, 
it was removed by a remedial order under section 10. That's a remarkable record when section four and section 10 only confer powers first on the court to say something and then on the government to introduce a remedial measure. The result of the governmental and parliamentary process in response to declarations of incompatibility is just the same as if we had a, a rule that an incompatibility with the convention identified by the courts must be removed except once in 20 years in some sort of extraordinary crisis. And you may have guessed that the one exception out of 29 declarations of incompatibility in 20 years is the extraordinary crisis over prisoners' rights to vote. Let me offer two explanations of what's going on in section four combined with section 10 and schedule two of the act. The first explanation is attractive, but I think it's mistaken. The second seems anomalous, but I think it is right. The first explanation starts with the proposition that human rights must be respected. And then you might say parliamentary sovereignty is contrary to the principle of respect for human rights because it enables parliament to act contrary to human rights. And since that regrettable doctrine could not be removed by statute, section four was the best that could be done in the unfortunate circumstances. And then because of the principle of respect for human rights, when a court issues a declaration of incompatibility, it is the moral duty of the government to take action, whether by ordinary legislation or through section 10 and the moral duty of members of parliament to approve the proposed legislation or remedial order. The second explanation of this aspect of the act, section four and section 10, is that after a declaration of incompatibility, the government ought to exercise its own constitutional responsibility in the legislature for initiative of legislation, bearing in mind that it has the special Henry VIII power that parliament conferred on it in section 10, but working with no presumption that the declaration of incompatibility requires either the section 10 power or the ordinary power of legislative initiative to be exercised. And members of parliament ought to decide whether to approve the legislation with no presumption that they should do so because the court has declared that the legislation, original legislation was incompatible with the convention. There should be no such presumption because in our constitution, the question of whether a statute ought to be changed is the very paradigm of a non-justiciable question. Now, there are problems with either explanation. The first entails that the UK constitution is defective. The constitution itself stands against respect for human rights. The second has the result that the law provides no remedy in light of a judicial determination of violation of right, not even a presumption that the violation is to be remedied. Then the Human Rights Act provides us for a sort of juridical anomaly in which a judicial determination of a violation of right has no real effect. For my part, I think the first interpretation explanation of section four is untenable. The UK constitution does not stand against respect for human rights. What it does is to allocate not only power, but also responsibility for respect, of human, for respect for human rights to Her Majesty's ministers and to the parliament. That allocation of power creates the possibility that they will misjudge matters of human right but that possibility arises with every power allocation. I think the second explanation is right. The resolution that it apparently creates has to lie in the proposition that the government and parliament may well carry out their responsibility with due respect for human rights, even where the court determines that our law is incompatible with the convention and the government proposes no measure to change the law or parliament does not approve a proposal. That actually does make sense, not only because judges may get things wrong, but also because of a provision of legislation is indeed contrary to the European Convention on Human Rights that does not actually guarantee that it is contrary to anyone's human rights. But in our legal and political culture, it is hard to hold these disorienting propositions in the collective mind and imagination we're all too well trained up in the notions that the judge's opinion on a matter within their jurisdiction is to be accepted and that respect for human rights requires compatibility with the convention. And we're especially well trained up in the idea that the government should not be second guessing the opinion of the judges. Now, 
it would be constructive if this anomaly in the nation's legal and political culture could be ameliorated. I don't know if it can. Amendment of the Human Rights Act may not be the answer. Statutes are not necessarily a good place to explain what's going on. And perhaps it is best for the act as it does now to confer a power without explaining it. I think the answer may lie in better public understanding, more candid political deliberation over the responsibilities of the various agencies of government. And I hope that the review will contribute to that understanding and that deliberation. Thank you very much, Timothy. Um, so we have received one question that relates specifically to this uh, topic, and that's the question of whether uh, Section 4 of the Human Rights Act in relation to declarations of incompatibility have teeth and whether the courts need something stronger. So that's a direct provocation to what Timothy's just had to say. Um, but I do wonder whether the um, members of the panel might like to either ask questions or make comments here that we could then draw on. But for the moment, those are uh, is the question that's uh, come in uh, directly. Let me let me start, but only by way of an introduction. The balance that section four is seeking to strike is that there has been a decision of the court that a particular piece of primary legislation is contrary to convention rights. It's incompatible with it. Then respecting the fact of parliamentary sovereignty in addition to the fact that the court's declaration is discretionary, the court is not obliged to make a de declaration, Parliament is not obliged to act. It is free not to act. Um, in fact, as these statistics I think show, it does tend to act, albeit it may take a little time. Um, is it toothless? I don't think so. Is, is there a problem? There may be a problem in one narrow sense. Section three gives the individual claimant a remedy if he or she succeeds. Section four, if, it, if an incompatibility is demonstrated and if it results in a declaration, may do wonderful things for the future if indeed they are wonderful things, but it may be of scant comfort to the individual claimant who's told, well, you picked a good point, but bad luck, nothing for you, but you'll feel much better because the future is okay. Um, I'm not being flippant. That's the weakness of section four, if, if there is one. What can be done about that is, not wanting to repeat, we have no conclusions at this stage, um, it's very difficult because any, anything going further than where it is uh, risks straying into the wrong side of parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, and that is a very important consideration. So that's where I think I would leave it. I've seen someone say that section four was developing on a freestanding basis. I'm simply not aware of that. Uh, the section four point tends to arise in a litigation um, where efforts have been made very often at the government's behest to interpret the statute compatibly with convention rights and the effort has failed. I, I'm not aware of and would be very interested to know if there are such cases of section four being used as some freestanding way uh, of developing the law. I don't believe that to be the case but I'm delighted if, to be cr cr corrected if I've got it wrong. So thank you, uh, Justice O'Regan. Um, that's, that's my short introduction to it. I'm thinking of something provocative to say now, to stir it up, but I can't think of a question for anyone which will do that. Well, it seems as if you've been provocative enough or somebody has been to at least raise two hands from your colleagues. So we'll start with Sir Stephen and then go to Maria Carl. I think I can be relied on to say something provocative. Um, I, I, I think the short answer on section four is that all the evidence is that the first explanation that um, Professor Endicott gave is the one that is accepted generally, rightly or wrongly. Uh, and indeed, the UK government has argued uh, that 
it will always comply and that's what makes section four an effective remedy so um i, I think that's where we are uh, i wanted to put together what nick friedman was saying about the difference between a legislative and a judicial function and what Alison was saying about the different methods of reasoning of the common law and uh, the convention because in some ways it seems to me that they they both argue in similar ways uh, she was saying that the convention jurisprudence argues on in relation to individual cases and individual uh, circumstances and so does the, so does the common law that the whole concept of a ratio dissidendi says that you only take the law as so far as it's taken uh, as necessary to decide the case in which the law was laid down. So in the, those two respects, they operate in a similar way. Uh, what operates differently, and this is where I come to the legislative function, what operates differently is particularly section four, but also other bits of the HRA, uh, which uh, tests legislation rather than conduct and my my definition of what distinguishes a legislative and a judicial function is that a legislative function is one that lays down the law authoritatively for future hypothetical cases uh, the, the the courts and the convention jurisprudence lays down the law for the case in hand um, but section four uh, takes that one steps further and says whatever uh, applied in this case applies to all the other cases in which the 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 enactment in question might apply in future and, and that it seems to me is uh, the different method of reasoning and it's not between the common law and the convention but it's between those two things and the hra thanks very much sir stephen maria thank you uh, so peter i'm going to take your mantle and ask a provocative question um, in relation to section three this time. So I understand at the, at the time of the enactment of the HRA that there could have been a perception that it, an unusually expansive interpretive power was necessary under section three because you were dealing with a system that's not attuned to human rights um, concerns in the way that the ECHR was going to bring that to bear. Um, and also there was a desire as far as I understand it that section four should be very rarely used. Um, but we have understood from the submissions that we have received that that the expansive part of the interpretive power under Section 3 is actually very rarely used itself. Um, and so I'm wondering, is it still necessary at this point, 20 years on, that, that it should be retained in that unusually expansive way? And if so, what are the grounds for arguing that? Thank you. And I'm going to take this moment just to pick up a few other um, questions that have come into the Q&A so that um, we might have a kind of a, a, a round tour de table to answer some of them. Uh, so one relates to whether there's a discretion, which uh, obviously uh, we, we, we've been discussing, on uh, that courts enjoy uh, when they find that there has been a breach of the convention rights in relation to a statute, and whether they're not in courts are not in, they should in fact not be a discretion, and courts should be in derogation of a duty um, uh, if they don't issue a declaration in, um, in compatibility and that they sh the discretion should be removed. Uh, a, a slightly different way of thinking about this is whether one ought to shift, as it were, the, the, uh, the, the, the way it works so that um, when courts find that there is uh, incompatibility between a legislative provision and a convention right, that they would strike down legislation rendering it prima facie nullity, which would allow, but allow parliament to reinstate if they wish. So you'd end up with a nullity and potentially with relief, I imagine, Sir Peter, but parliament could undo that if it wished. Um, and then there's a, another question which goes to uh, Timothy Endicott's point. And uh, the questioner agrees with uh, Timothy's point that the, um, there might be legitimate and reasonable disagreement between the political organs and the court's adjudication of a question of a, of a convention right. Um, but if the court uses section three to interpret the legislation compatibly with the convention right, then there's very little room for parliament to disagree short of reenacting the legislation. So whether there isn't the need for a rebalancing towards section four from away from section three, if the con constitutional understanding that uh, Timothy Endicott proposed um, uh, were to, to be established. And uh, that really is to rebut in a sense your point, Timothy, that 
it may not be able to achieve this through amending the HRA. So you might like to come back and comment on that. You also might like to comment, Timothy, on another question that came in, which is um, what precisely you would want to achieve with public education to achieve your second understanding of the constitutional um, principles that underpin section four. So there's a series of questions. I see Sandy would like to come in. Please, everybody just indicate if you would, and we'll take them in order. So Sandy, and then Stevie, and then Alison. Uh, yes, uh, thanks so much, Kate. So I, I, I really wanted to respond to two of the points that um, Professor Carhill made. Um, the first one is about um, the quality of deliberation and the point this is left over from the last session, which is the point that she made that uh, some people regard European Court of Human Rights as just making declaratory statements. And I, I think if you look at the, the judgments, I, I, I don't think that is the case. They, there is a very, very detailed um, canvassing of all the different ways in which the case has been presented, not only from the parties, but third parties, other international instruments, et cetera. And that is almost always, or well, it is always followed by um, a set of principles which the court derives from its own case law which very carefully and coherently set out the principles which it consistently applies. And then as Alison said, from there, from those principles, the application is always to the individual case which the European court uh, sees as its mission, which is about resolving individual breaches of human rights. So I, I would like to say that I think actually there is um, quite a detailed expansion of the principles which the European court of human rights uses and often a very detailed um, re reference back to its previous case law, which it has and how it's developed that much like, as Sir Stephen said, like the common law. Um, the second point is whether we could have section four with our section three. And this I, on this I draw on the submission which the group of Ox, uh, Oxford public lawyers of which I was part made to to the Commission, and, and that is to make the point that it's difficult to see how Section 4 could operate without an interpretive power in the court. So the court, before it decides that anything or any uh, legislation is incompatible, or, um, it first needs to interpret that legislation and it cannot, and it will always need to take that step of interpreting it. So the, um, the, the use, Section 3 and Section 4, really need to be seen as a whole. First, the court looks at the provision and does do its best, because this is a legislative provision, to, um, to see it as compatible with uh, the convention, which is what the Human Rights Act mandates to courts to do on the basis that it was Parliament's intention that legislation should be compatible with human rights. Um, it needs to have this phrase so far as possible, because if it were just um, um, a, a looser uh, provision, then there would be so many more potential uh, routes to back to the European Court of Rights, Human Rights, again, bringing um, rights home as an object of um, putting it on the back burner. So I, I just wanted to make those two points and thank you very much. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Stevie. Thank you, Kate. Hopefully my internet stays stable. Um, I just wanted to say uh, on the topic of the discretionary nature of Section 4, um, uh, I think the case of Sarah Hewitt uh, that was before the Northern Ireland um, Queen's Bench High Court case uh, probably illuminates the benefit of of having a degree of discretion, because in that case, obviously, whilst it was proceeding, things had changed and things were changing in terms of the regulatory scheme um, surrounding abortion in Northern Ireland. And, and while she had been successful in terms of challenging the compatibility um, in a very brief judgment, uh, the Queen's Bench was very clear that there was no utility in issuing a declaration. And so I think that retains that strength in terms of we only issue where it's, it's necessary. And that does, I think, prevent that dilution. Thank you. Um, Addison. Thank you. I'll, I'll try my best to be brief. Um, in response to the very early question uh, from Sir Peter about is there a standalone section four? I, I don't believe there is a standalone section four. 
right, but I think where some people might think this is coming from is that in some cases, applicants plead section four, but don't necessarily plead section three. So one recent example is the Steinfeld case on um, whether you can have heterosexual civil partnerships. But also in that case, there was real, no real possibility to plead section three, because unless you wanted to take out the word not, which obviously would be going far beyond what the courts can do, it would, be very, would have been very difficult to have actually interpreted in line. So perhaps that is where this idea of, of standalone in, in some cases is coming from. Um, in response to Maria's uh, question about whether we should backtrack from section three, I, I think I don't think we see section three as necessarily having had a radical reading from the wording uh, and now we want to make it less radical. I think the, re the wording has always been so far as possible. What has changed is how the courts have interpreted that in line of experience and as they've developed using the cases. And in doing so, they have been sensitive to linguistic limits. They've been sensitive to fundamental features of legislation, but they've also been sensitive to those situations in which a resolution to protect convention rights is better suited to parliament intervening and therefore making a section four declaration rather than using a section three interpretation. And in some of the cases where you do find examples of more radical interpretations, sometimes those have actually been pleaded for by the government and agreed to by the parties themselves. So I think it's, it's not a straightforward, it was radical, no, it doesn't need to be. I think there's a whole range of separate circumstances that influence how we you, how the courts use Section 3. And I think, in a way, I think the courts have developed in a very sensitive way that recognises changing situations. So I don't think changing the wording would make any difference to that. Uh, thanks, Alison. Uh, yes, so Peter. Sorry, sorry to butt in, but I'm very grateful to Alison, Professor Young, for... Um, for the point about standalone. Um, I was simply concerned, I'd read somewhere, somebody suggesting it was developing on a standalone basis, and I didn't think I'd seen it. Uh, I can quite understand that in a particular case, someone might run section four while not seeking to develop section three, whether that's good forensic tactics or not, not, not for us to say. Um, I would be concerned if Section 4 was developing aside from any particular item of litigation. Your example is very helpful because it shows it simply as part uh, of a discrete piece of litigation where the issue arose. Um, if it's of help, I'm happy to answer the questions just so Regan flagged, at least so far as my views carry any weight. Um, I, be I, would, I would be for myself, very unhappy to see a court obliged to issue a declaration. Uh, declarations are in general discretionary remedies. Uh, and the idea of this particular declaration being obligatory strikes me as circumscribing the court's power to find the remedy that does justice in the individual case. For myself, I would be very alarmed at that. Um, equally, I would be distinctly alarmed uh, about the upshot of a finding of incompatibility being nullity in the sense of primary legislation, with Parliament uh, having the option when it gets time to do so, to resurrect it. Um, I, I see that route as absolutely fraught uh, and raising immense difficulties on the constitutional balance. Um, if you asked for a personal view on section four, it doesn't do too badly. Um, in the sense that it, it um, has to strike a, a very difficult balance. And I can understand what it does, I'm not saying that's a concluded view of any description, let alone that it's anyone else's view. Um, thank you, that, that is all I wanted to say for the, for the moment. Thank you very much. There, there is one more question, and I, I'm going to come back to Timothy in a moment, because a couple of the questions were directed at him. Uh, the last question is, or, or the last, perhaps it's more of a comment, it, it re responds to something you said, St Sir Stephen, about whether courts, when they are, as it were, giving an interpretation that it, uh, under Section 4, it seems to be a prospective application, much closer to your definition of legislation than to your definition of adjudication. Um, but the question comment is really whether that's not the case very often with all statutory interpretation, although of course it may have immediate implications in the case, I just put that in brackets, but, um, but the question also points out that in this case under the HRA, 
Parliament has expressly sanctioned this approach. Um, and so whether, even if it is sailing a little more closely to a legislative function, whether that isn't actually justified in relation to the parliamentary imprimatur that it bears. Uh, you may want to respond to that, I'm not sure. But first, I'd like to go to Timothy, because there were a couple of questions directed at you, Timothy, that I think you might like to respond to. Thank you, Kate. Um, in answer to Rahul Bajaj's question about what could be achieved by better understanding, well, it would be nice if no one ever said on the BBC that the judges have struck down a statute. Um, but I think actually, it, more than um, general public understanding, I think it would be good if all the actors in Parliament, in government and Parliament, internalized what Sir Peter said, that, that Parliament is free not to act. And, and I would add not only Parliament, but the government. The government is free to initiate no legislation, to propose no measure, no remedial measure. Um, and, and then it is their responsibility to determine the grounds upon which they should or should not make a remedial order. In answer to Jonathan Morgan's comment, I do, I do agree that uh, there is a risk that if, if courts um, d decide that it's possible to um, treat a statutory provision as if it were compatible when they ought to have used Section 4, that will be damaging to the framework of the Act. I agree with Sandy Fredman that Section 3 and Section 4 should work as a whole. And, and then that's, that's the risk of overuse of Section 3, of course. Um, and here's a, here's a puzzle I have about it, and I, I don't know if Sir Peter will have a moment to say anything about this, but I'd be very intrigued to know what he thinks about it. Um, suppose, I'm not saying it's ever happened, but suppose a government minister sees that, uh, hears about this some litigation and sees that the claimant is going to persuade the court that some uh, rule, some rule as, as in, some legislation as interpreted is contrary to the convention right. Um, what if it's gonna be a big nuisance and a political headache and, and, and unwanted to deliberate in government and in parliament about whether to remove the incompatibility? Well, what if the minister says to the lawyers, oh no, um, talk the court into arguing, in, into using section three. And then you've got the lawyer for the claimant who wants a remedy and the lawyer for the government that doesn't wanna mess around with section four. Um, in cahoots, uh, that rather distorts the litigation process in which the court is meant to have the assistance of counsel on both sides of the issue. And of course, Parliament is never a party to the litigation. I, I just think it's a structural problem with litigation, party and party litigation in Human Rights Act claims under using section three and section four, that the government might be in favor of using section three to deal with the problem that they have. I just want one- Raises a very interesting question for somebody who might like to do some empirical research for a thesis, it seems to me. Um, <laughs> uh, so turning then to Simon and then so Stephen uh, for coming to the end of the session now. No, uh, uh, thank you, Ken. And, uh, and this one for Nick, I, I, I sort of feel I probably know what his answer is going to be based on your very good summary at the beginning. And just bear in mind that, as we all know what we're talking about here, is a balancing of rights. So if Parliament looks at an issue, it balances the rights based on what it's done, and it considers, because it makes a Section 19 uh, declaration, that it's got the balance right. They come, come to the courts, the courts listen to all kinds of sub submissions, certainly from particular interest groups, and says, we think you got the balance wrong. Uh, and then it either has a perhaps the sort of Endicott-style discussion with the government who says, well, to the extent that's where you're going, we'd prefer you to deal with it in an interpretive way rather than Parliament having to grasp the nettle, or it goes Section 4 and Parliament has to grasp the nettle. The answer is, is there anything that can be done to, to help the courts on this, or some may say hinder? In other words, one of the submissions that we had, uh, with, which made reference to the Immigration Act 2014, said, well, when Parliament is balancing rights, it should say right up front, here's what the balance is, and you, the courts, are stuck with it, which means effectively the courts were only going to have a section four route. So is it would it be a good or bad thing for Parliament to be doing more at the time of a particular statute and duration where it says the balance should be struck? Thank you. Uh, so Stephen. Uh, 
Well, I was going to answer the two questions that were um, asked of me. But before I do, I just wanted to say to uh, Timothy Endicott that we certainly had some evidence, and I think some of it was empirical, to the effect that the uh, Kahoot situation is um, not an infrequent occurrence in reality. Uh, so where the government doesn't want to go to section four and the uh, defendant wants a proper remedy, uh, the applicant wants a proper remedy. And so everybody agrees to settle the matter under section three. Um, the two questions that were asked to me, uh, I'll answer them in the reverse order because the answer to the second one, um, parliament intended it. Uh, yes, probably it did. Uh, but as I said in my very first comment, uh, our terms of reference are not confined to deciding whether or not the Human Rights Act uh, does what it was intended to do. It's whether it uh, it produces a, a the best possible adequate system in, in the terms in which we've been asked to look at it. Um, the second question is, isn't every question of statutory interpretation something that uh, covers what I said, a authoritative pronouncement of, uh, of the law in relation to future hypothetical cases. Well, I think not, uh, because what a court says, or what, at least what it should be saying when it's asked a question of statutory interpretation is, uh, does this statute apply to these facts? Uh, not what did this statute mean and what does it mean in this case and what does it mean in all other cases? And uh, I accept that there is sometimes a difficult dividing line and indeed a line that sometimes is crossed. Uh, there was a recent case, I'm sure I can remember what it's called, I think it may be called R.V. Barton, where the, the uh, Court of Appeal decided to set out in detail what it thought dishonest, dishonestly means in a criminal statute. Uh, and, and the matter complicated by the fact that, of course, um, the, the courts at first instance needed guidance on how to um, direct juries. Uh, but that seemed to me to be sort of at least on the edge of the line in that it was uh, it was providing a legislative solution to what um, the act was supposed to be uh, rather than a, a simple answer to the question which would have constituted the ratio dissidenti of the case, which is whether uh, in the case in question there had been dishonesty. Thank you very much, Sir Stephen. And I think that brings us to the end of this uh, this panel and to the series of um, of questions. I'm now going to turn to Sir Peter. I'd just like to thank all the panelists who've spoken and the members of the panel for their questions and all the members of the public who've put such interesting questions in through the Q&A. Sir Peter. Well, may I thank you, uh, everyone, uh, just Sir Regan for chairing it, uh, all panel uh, colleagues uh, and all speakers uh, together with uh, audience participants uh, what a stimulating session. I get to be particularly unfair and slip in two remarks, seeing I think I'm the last speaker, so I can't be got at. Um, the cahoots problem, I'm not sure it's a problem. After all, at the end of the day, a judge of sufficient moral fibre will simply say, I'm not going that way if I don't like it. Uh, if the judge is content and actually most of our senior judges are, are fairly tough-minded, uh, they will say, I'm just not buying section three. So you can agree what you like, but that's not where I'm going. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Um, but if it doesn't, then I question just how much of a problem it really is. The question, Professor Endicott, is a really interesting one. I suspect it explains a good many cases. I'm not sure that's bad news. Um, but I, I follow your reasoning completely. Just to illustrate how interesting this can get, may I pick up on my panel colleague, Sir Stephen Law's last observation. I think he's referring to the case where the Court of Appeal was dealing with the question of gosh, G-H-O-S-H, dishonesty. It arose from recollection in a gaming case. One of the problems is that the, the Supreme Court decision was distinctly obiter. So there was a problem of stare decisis or precedent. The real problem, nothing to do with what we're discussing, but it shows why drawing these lines can be very difficult in practice. The real problem for the Court of Appeal of which, let me be clear, I was not a member, was how to make sense of this 
not for the great case in front of it, but for the endless judges up and down the country directing juries. So they may have been a little adventurous, some might say, in setting out the law rather than getting another case back to the Supreme Court to lay it down authoritatively. Um, but in the meantime, there'd be countless directions that would have fallen foul of what the Supreme Court had said, albeit obiter, if my recollection of the events is right. And, and that's the practical edge of this, how it's actually going to work. Enough from me, I've probably spoken too much there. Uh, really thank you to both universities, to all participants. Uh, I can risk it at 1628. Uh, thank you to the technical teams who have largely kept us going uh, without mishap. I wouldn't have dared say that at 1430, uh, but well done, much appreciated. I don't know what we'll decide, but we'll go away from today's session uh, with some very stimulating thoughts to contemplate uh, and much better informed. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Sir Peter. And then I'm going to turn to Professor Anne Davies to have the last, uh, last word. I'm enjoying the fact that uh, as we're in it, a university setting, the chair of the panel is not the person who gets the last word. Um, so I I've thoroughly enjoyed this session and I hope it's been of benefit to the panel. We've heard a huge range of views. Um, I know that there are some deeply held, um, strongly felt disagreements lurking in all of that, um, but I think they've been beautifully clearly expressed and uh, well explained. And I do hope that's been helpful. Um, I like, without being too flippant about it, to entertain the possibility that uh, you may, uh, as it were, across some of those divides, both be right, because the case law is so rich and so diverse now that I think you can find uh, supporting evidence for many different propositions when it comes to, to the Human Rights Act. Of course, we can just uh, enjoy the debate, but the panel has to reach a consensus, and I wish you uh, the very best of luck with that particular challenge, uh, which I don't envy you. Um, and I would like also to add my thanks to everyone uh, involved uh, in putting this event together, particularly to uh, the panelists who've shared their thoughts and the uh, panel members who've been so open and so willing to engage. Um, and especially to Kate for fantastic chairing. You've worked very hard this afternoon. So uh, well done you and good luck to the panel with your ongoing deliberations. Thank you.